So Dr. Scholz, recently we've had a new FDA approval in prostate cancer, Pluvicto, which is part of the Lutetium 177 story. Can you talk about like what is Pluvicto? When is it going to get approved? I mean, we're really excited about this. Anything that we can have to fight advanced prostate cancer is very exciting. It's a injectable anti-cancer medicine. Uh, it's administered, I think, on a every six-week protocol. It's um, an intravenous injection. And the beauty of it is that it's uh, very targeted against prostate cancer. It uses the same technology that these new PSMA PET scans used. Um, the PSMA PET scans have a monoclonal antibody that sticks only to prostate cancer. They put a low energy uh, radioactive uh, moiety on that molecule so that the radioactivity sticks to the prostate cancer throughout the body. And then they put you in a scanner and they can see where the cancer is. Well, intelligent people figured out, well, if you can put a low energy radioactive moiety, why not put a high energy radioactive moiety and kill the cancer rather than merely visualize it on a scan? And that's what Pluvict is. And it, uh, it works. We've uh, had patients that have traveled to other countries where it's already been approved for a couple years. And it uh, uh, is something for people who have really been through a lot, have metastatic disease, uh, who've become hormone resistant, who uh, have been exposed to taxotere chemotherapy in the past, and that isn't working. In the past, we didn't have a whole lot of options for that, uh, you know, experimental trials and other things. Uh, but uh, we have been very gratified to see well over half of the patients that would travel to other countries and get this uh, new medicine would have notable responses, declines in PSA, disappearance of, of bone pain, and uh, thankfully with relatively uh, few side effects. The most common thing is the PSMA antibody, which is on the surface of prostate cancer cells and salivary gland cells, uh, does draw some of the radiation into the salivary glands, and some of the patients get a dry mouth from salivary gland uh, reduction of saliva. Uh, hasn't been a super prominent problem, but it is noticeable in some people. And uh, also, in theory, can cause a reduction in white cells because they're more sensitive to radiation, which I haven't seen a whole lot of, honestly. So it's been very well tolerated and made a really big difference in people who would run out of other options. So as far as the staging goes, you know, you mentioned that people would have to have failed hormone therapy and had some form of chemotherapy. Is that the only stage it's available in currently? I'm not sure exactly how it's going to shake out because it'll come down to what uh, the insurance companies are willing to pay for. And I think uh, since it was studied in that uh, type of pa patient population that it's likely that they'll want some previous exposure to chemo, that the patients would be hormone, um, hormone uh, resistant. So we don't know yet. Uh, how soon are we going to be able to uh, start giving this with insurance coverage in the, here in the United States? Uh, I've been having some conversations with the company. It looks like maybe in a month or two. So I would hope by the summertime, uh, people will be able to uh, have uh, this medicine available uh, and covered by their insurance. You mentioned regarding the side effects of dry mouth. Is that a permanent side effect, or would that just be a temporary side effect, like while they're having treatment? I think it could be permanent. Uh, that, uh, and I don't have enough experience. We've probably only treated about maybe 20 patients with this medicine to know if it's something that does slowly improve over time, but it certainly can linger after the treatment has been completed. And as far as other treatments go, I mean, would patients stop the chemo in order to take Pluvicto, or would they continue chemo? How does that protocol usually go out? Well, the standard approach in, in oncology typically is that if you're stopping a medicine because it's ineffective, uh, that you'll, you will go off of that. Uh, the exceptions in the prostate world are people that have stopped responding to Lupron. Typically, they're left on Lupron for life. Uh, that same policy is not usually used for other medicines like Taxotere or Zytiga or Extandi, though we sometimes will leave people on uh, Extandi and Zytiga just for the same principle that we leave people on Lupron. Uh, we leave people on Lupron because we believe that there may be certain subtypes of prostate cancer cells that are sleeping but not dying as a result of low testosterone and, and allowing testosterone to come back. Uh, or giving them access to testosterone may stimulate some of the cancer cells to grow. So our policy usually is to leave people on Lupron. If they've been progressing on Xtandi or Zytiga, uh, we may leave them on that as well. 
but certainly not taxotere. Taxotere can cause a lowering of blood counts, and in theory, uh, lutetium-177 can cause a lowering of blood counts, and so you wouldn't want to have an interaction in that regard. As far as the imaging goes, does the patients have to have like known spots on a PSMA scan? Like what if their PSA is rising, they've failed hormone therapy, they've failed chemo, they're searching for the cancer, but there's, you know, we don't see it on the PSMA scan. So I think that will be a requirement is that patients will have had to have had a previous PSMA PET scan that shows metastatic disease. And the reason being is that uh, about 10% of prostate cancer patients don't have PSMA on their cancer cell surfaces, and the lutetium-177, therefore, is probably not going to work on those people because uh, it won't stick to the cancer cell. So uh, PSMA PET scans uh, are becoming much more routine now, and uh, I predict that in short order they're going to replace the traditional bone scans and CAT scans. But for this particular treatment, yes, uh, there'll be a need to confirm that uh, a potential patient isn't one of the 10% that doesn't have PSMA, in which case we wouldn't expect this treatment to work. Now, I know we're still finding out the guidelines for insurance coverage and all that, but do you suspect that it would cover and be covered in like oligometastatic or would they have to have like more than five spots? Is it typical that they could just see one and get the treatment? I don't know how that's going to shake out. Uh, there are clinical trials starting up. UCLA is starting up a clinical trial for oligometastatic prostate cancer. Uh, just to refresh people's minds, that is five or fewer metastatic sites. Um, oftentimes in people that have hormone-sensitive disease, although they could be hormone resistant. Yeah, getting payment for it in that setting will probably be difficult, but it is an interesting idea because it's becoming fairly mainstream now that if people have two or three metastatic spots that they are referred to a radiation therapist for treatment to those spots. Historically, people always said, once it's out of the barn, you can treat three spots, but you're only just uh, getting to the tip of the iceberg. There's other smaller spots and don't bother to treat those three spots. But that, uh, that thinking has been altered because the scans have gotten so much better, a certain percentage of patients only have those three spots, and they can get a huge benefit by, getting, uh, by eradicating those three metastatic spots. The idea of adding lutetium-177 to the whole process is that if there are other smaller cancer spots that are flying under the radar that weren't picked up, maybe this medicine will be effective in eradicating those tiny little spots. We use that rationale in giving people chemotherapy sometimes when they have oligometastatic disease, going after the small spots that we can't see on the scans. So it's a, an investigational approach, which uh, I don't think any, we don't know the answer as to whether that will be beneficial, but there is a study ongoing to try and answer that question. So as far as access goes, once this, you know, we see if whether insurance covers it or not, you know, is it any place that can do a PSMA scan could possibly be doing the plavicto treatment as well? Yeah. I, I th think that's true. We ran into the same questions when uh, Zofigo got approved, which is a injectable form of uh, uh, radium that can uh, swim around in the body and find uh, bone metastasis and radiate them. It doesn't attack uh, prostate cancer that would be in the lymph nodes along the liver, but in the bones, which is a common site, uh, Zofigo is effective. And uh, it uh, was the first time that I would be referring patients to facilities that do nuclear scans. Uh, they're not really clinicians. And uh, they were a little bit like fish out of water, these physicians. You'd refer them as Zofigo patient, and you could tell they were in the back room looking through their, uh, their uh, medical manuals about prostate cancer and trying to understand, and sometimes not understanding the, that the clinical responsibility still resides with the, with the doctor ordering it, the medical oncologist or the urologist. And, uh, we're just asking them to give the injection because we're not uh, licensed to give radioactive materials. And that uh, may come up again also with lutetium, that the uh, is it going to be the radiation therapists that give it? They're experienced with treating patients. The nuclear medicine doctors who do scans but typically don't see patients. It is a very safe and it's very logical that either of them could do that. But uh, I don't know how it, it's going to play out. If we key off of what happened with Zofigo, it may be the nuclear medicine doctors that are administering this. Thanks for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer, you can go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every week. And go ahead and visit our website, pcri.org. We have tons of information on prostate cancer that will help you.